Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the NATF online support group this evening. It's seven o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. This evening, we are delighted to have Dr. Alex Schmeyer, a cardiovascular medicine fellow at Brigham and Women's Hospital with us. And he is going to be going through the plethora of new treatment options that patients and physicians have to treat venous thromboembolism. Um, so we will go ahead and keep everyone's lines muted. If you have a question, feel free to use the question section, um, which is underneath the audio um, portion of the control panel that will show up. And I will do my best to make sure all questions are addressed. Um, and also, I did want to note that we do have a handout for this evening that is listed under the handout section. It's the NATF anticoagulation comparison chart. Uh, it's a list of all the different medical treatments currently available for VTE. Um, and we thought it would be a useful tool to help aid in this evening's discussion. So hopefully you guys can all see that. It's attached as a PDF. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Schmeyer, um, who has a wonderful presentation for us. Dr. Schmeyer. Thank you, Catherine. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, again, my name is Alex Schmeyer. Uh, I am a cardiologist and a, a vascular medicine fellow at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And tonight we're gonna be talking about anticoagulation for venous thromboembolism and, and a, with an attempt at demystifying the drugs. So, um, oh, I, uh, my dis oh, I, I, my disclosure slide looks like it got slipped away. So um, I'll show that in a second. But we'll start with a case presentation, um, which I hope will may actually kind of bring up some of the experiences that many of you went through when you uh, were diagnosed um, with a blood clot. So let's talk about a 52-year-old woman with a history of Crohn's disease who uh, twists her left ankle after slipping on black ice. Um, she had x-rays that were negative for a fracture or dislocation, and she was put in an, immobili uh, an immobilizer brace and given crutches. Um, 10 days later, her ankle is much better, but she notices pain and fullness in her left calf. And, and then the next day, she develops uh, shortness of breath and pain when taking deep breaths. Um, she calls her doctor who advises her to go to the emergency department. Um, Here's my disclosure slide. I think they've got flipped around. Importantly, I have no disclosures. Um, I'm not beholden to any pharmaceutical companies in giving this talk. So moving on back to the case. So our patient in the emergency room, she's found to have a fast heart rate and breathing rapidly. She undergoes a CT scan, which finds a pulmonary embolus and an ultrasound of her legs finds a DVT in the left popliteal vein. So she's given a bolus of unfractionated heparin through an IV, and then a, a continuous infusion of heparin and admitted to the hospital. The next morning, her medical team, uh, after rounds, decides to switch her to a noxaparin injection uh, called Lovenox, given uh, subcutaneously in her stomach. And she feels much better. She's ready to go home the next day. And at this point, she's given an oral medication, Eliquis, at the time of discharge. Um, so I bring up this case just to um, demonstrate that this patient has received three different medications uh, over the course of two days, and um, there's a lot going on. She's extremely anxious um, with this new diagnosis, as I'm sure many of you were. She's trying to understand what a blood clot is, why did this happen to her, and her doctors are telling her she needs to be on a blood thinner, but they keep on switching up the medications. Uh, do, do they know what they're doing? Um, so I hope our talk tonight can uh, detangle and demystify uh, some of these issues and um, discuss the rationale for why we use the drugs uh, that we do. Um, so we're going to talk tonight about the mechanism of venous thromboembolism and the rationale for anticoagulation. We're going to talk about the phases of anticoagulation, uh, acute, short-term, and extended. We're going to talk about IV or subcutaneous anticoagulation. Uh, usually with heparins, and we'll be talking about oral anticoagulation uh, with warfarin or a new class of drugs, the direct oral anticoagulation, uh, anticoagulants. And at the end, we'll have time for questions and comments. Um, so why do we 
um, put patients on anticoagulation. Um, uh, venous thromboembolism, which includes uh, DVTs and pulmonary embolisms, uh, PE, um, DVT means deep vein thrombosis, they, they account for the third highest cause of, um, mort of cardiovascular death after heart attacks and strokes. Um, and anticoagulation has been proven to treat the symptoms of venous thromboembolism that can be leg pain or swelling um, and uh, the symptoms of a pulmonary embolus, which could be shortness of breath and chest pain. Um, they uh, reduce um, the mortality associated with venous thromboembolism and they also reduce uh, the recurrence rate of venous thromboembolism. <clears throat> so I think to understand the drugs we use, we need to understand a little bit of the mechanism that underlies uh, venous thromboembolism. So our um, bodies are designed to keep blood inside the blood vessels. This is pretty important as you can imagine. And we've adapted a very um, complex system uh, to basically form a blood clot when we have an injury to a blood vessel. Um, and, and so this is called the coagulation cascade. And this system is important for keeping blood where it belongs, but when a blood clot forms in a vessel um, that isn't cut open, isn't bleeding, um, this blood clot can become a deep vein thrombosis and a pulmonary embolus. So the factors that go into form forming a blood clot include these um, pathways that formulate the coagulation cascade. Um, this is, uh, slide looks pretty complicated, but it's actually uh, a simplified version of a lot of science over, over 50 years of uh, biomedical research went into understanding this. So um, in our blood, we have these factors called coagulation factors, and they, they each have Roman numerals. On one side, we have this pathway called the intrinsic pathway, where um, the top factor, factor 12, um, is activated in response to um, certain molecules inside the blood that shouldn't be there. And then it activates a series of enzymes. Um, factor 12 activates whoop, factor um, 11, then factor 9, then factor 8. Um, they're out of order. Uh, that's because that was the order that they were discovered, not the order in which they activate. And finally, ending up on factor 10. And then on the other side, there's the extrinsic pathway. When uh, a blood vessel is injured, um, this protein called tissue factor is exposed. Um, it's normally outside the blood vessel. It gets exposed to the blood and it activates factor seven, which then um, all coalesces at activation of factor 10. This activates an enzyme called thrombin, which um, cuts this molecule fibrinogen into fibrin. And just like it sounds, fibrin makes the fibers of a blood clot. And um, so understanding this process has allowed um, us to develop um, drugs that target various parts of this pathway. And these are the anticoagulants that we use in clinical practice. So I like to show this to people because I think it gives us an understanding of where the drugs work and, and helps us understand why we use um, what we use. So. The, the, the number of anticoagulants that we have, um, you know, in our system, uh, you know, kind of our, our toolkit um, is pretty immense. Um, so basically, the, the drugs, um, we have to, it, it becomes kind of an alphabet soup. It's really complicated. So um, as and it's complicated for physicians, it's definitely going to be complicated for patients as well. So we have to think about, um, we have all these different drugs. We have to think about how they're administered, either IV um, subcutaneous or oral. Um, we have to think about how much they're cleared by the kidneys. Um, this affects how safe they are. Um, and we have to think about the half-life, which is kind of the time in which the, the drug is still in our system. Some of the half-lives are very short, um, one and a half hours. Some are very long, almost a whole day. And then we have to think about how the drug is dosed. Is it a weight-based dosing? Um, is it uh, based on monitored drug levels or is there a fixed dose? Um, so these are, we're going to go into all of those drugs in detail as we go through the talk. So when, when someone has a blood clot and when we're treating it with anticoagulation, we think about the different phases of treatment. 
So there's the acute phase, which starts the moment you come into the hospital and are diagnosed with a blood clot. And that may last for just a couple days or um, you know five to 10 days or so. And then after that, we move into the, the short-term phase, uh, which is three to six months. And this is the, the time period uh, during which the blood clot uh, dissolves and goes away. And then we think about extended long-term anticoagulation that may go beyond three to six months. Um, and these are uh, some of the drugs listed below that we may use at each one of these time points. And I'm gonna go into each one of them in detail at this point. <clears throat> so acute in-hospital anticoagulation. Um, this is when you are found in the emergency department to have a, a, a DVT in the leg and you're having a lot of pain and swelling where you have shortness of breath and chest pressure, found to have a pulmonary embolus. And our goals at this point are really to prevent extension of the DVT, uh, prevent it from growing at all, um, prevent a PE from occurring or recurring if you already have one. Uh, we're trying to relieve symptoms, um, so improve that leg swelling and pain, improve the sh shortness of breath, and normalize vital signs and hemodynamics. Our goal is, is to make the patient feel better. Um, and so our, uh, the drug we use in, in this case is, um, is, is as a heparin drug most of the time. Um, so, so what are heparins? Um, heparins are actually, um, they're, they're small molecules of, of varying length and they're, um, they're basically starches. Um, they're um, pentasaccharide compounds and part of these larger compounds called glycosaminoglycans. So they're naturally occurring uh, starch-like compounds that are actually extracted from intestines, uh, mostly from pig also from cow and horse. Um, and so it, it's kind of crude, but uh, unfractionated heparin is just a, a processing of these um, starches that are found um, in, in tissues naturally. And we, we make our own heparin molecules. And the way heparins work is that um, they have this sequence, this pentasaccharide sequence. Um, that means five sugars. And this five sugar residue binds this protein antithrombin and uh, activates it so that it can, like its name says, inhibit thrombin and the coagulation factor 10A um, about a thousand fold uh, more effectively than it could without the heparin. Um, so basically heparins turn on this antithrombin molecule um, and the unfractionated heparins are actually these, these longer um, uh, sugar uh, kind of starch substances that can also link up antithrombin to some other coagulation proteins like thrombin and factor 12 um, and inhibit them that way. Um, low molecular weight heparins, which we'll talk about some more, are kind of uh, processed and refined and don't have this um, longer sequence that's able to link the antithrombin and the thrombin together. So they mostly just turn on um, antithrombin and make it high affinity um, to inhibit factor 10. So where these proteins work, unfractionated heparin can inhibit a lot of coagulation factors. Uh, mostly it's factor 10 and thrombin, but it also inhibits factors 12, 11, um, and nine. Whereas low molecular heparins really work just by inhibiting um, <clears throat> factor 10. So um, why do we use unfractionated heparin? Um, it's an IV drug. What's really great about it is that it has a very quick onset and offset. So we give it as an IV bolus, a bolus dose, and very quickly the patient is anticoagulated. If there's problems with, with bleeding or need for an urgent surgery, we turn the drug off and it's out of the system within a couple hours. The drug is safe to use if you have kidney dysfunction, which is <clears throat> um, pretty common in some of the sick patients we take care for. There's an antidote um, that we can give if there's bleeding issues called protamine that will reverse the heparin. And you can adjust the dose, you can dial it up or dial it down uh, to change the intensity of anticoagulation. <clears throat> um, some of the drawbacks are that um, heparins need to be monitored in order to adjust the dose. So we need to measure um, a blood test called the PTT um, every few hours. It, it might be three or four times in the first day. So that's really a pain. Um, it's a continuous IV infusion, so you're kind of 
uh, tethered to an IV pole. Um, and uh, because the um, kind of the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics are very variable, um, it can be harder to achieve the ideal dose. This could lead to more bleeding and, and being less effective uh, in certain cases. And uh, the most severe um, downside is this complication called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, where the platelet count drops um, and paradoxically you're actually at a higher risk for a blood clot. Um, so the development of low molecular weight heparins, this, um, the most common one that we use is anoxaparin or the brand name is Lovenox. Um, what's, what's great about them is that you can just give them twice a day, every 12 hours and, and forget it. Um, the drugs, uh, we, we know exactly how well the drug, drugs are absorbed and how they should be dosed um, and how long they last for in the body. So they're very reliable and therefore the patient isn't tethered to an IV, they can move around more, more freely. And because the dosing is just more reliable, um, large uh, studies suggest that low molecular heparin may be more effective with less bleeding um, for treating venous thromboembolism. What are the drawbacks? Well, you can't use these drugs if you have a significant kidney dysfunction because they're cleared by the kidney and uh, drug levels will, will build up. And the antidote um, that we use for heparin is, uh, is less effective um, at reversing um, low molecular weight heparin. So <clears throat> those are the main drugs for acute anticoagulation. Um, Fondaparinux is, is a type of low molecular weight heparin that's purely synthetic, so it's really the same type of drug. And then DOACs are also mentioned, and we'll come back to those uh, drugs in just a little bit. So now you're um, feeling better, you're ready to be discharged from the hospital. Um, and at this point, we think about uh, anticoagulation for three to six months, usually with an oral medicine. And <clears throat> why three to six months? Um, this is the, the amount of time it takes for the blood clot to, uh, to dissolve, to, to go away. Um, anticoagulation does not actually break down the blood clot. Um, our bodies are constantly making and breaking down clot all the time. Um, so our bodies uh, naturally have all the machinery to break down blood clots as well. Um, we talked about the coagulation cascade. The breaking down of blood clots is called fibrinolysis, and our bodies do that naturally. Anticoagulation just kind of tips the scales towards um, breaking down more clot than making it. So that's why it takes um, a few months for the clot to go away. <clears throat> um, and so... The oral medication that is, um, has traditionally been used as a blood thinner is, is warfarin. And um, the, the story behind warfarin is kind of interesting. Um, it, it, you know, the drug is, is very old. It um, was put into use in the, in the 1950s. And in the decade before that, it was found that um, uh, livestock were dying from some uh, a bleeding condition. And it was found to be associated with eating feed that was contaminated with spoiled sweet clover. And what was discovered was that a, a fungi would metabolize these, um, these uh, compounds called coumarins that were in these grasses to make these dicoumarol compounds. And dicoumarols have natural anticoagulant activity. <clears throat> and so uh, this research was um, funded by the Wisconsin uh, Alumni Research Foundation, uh, the, which um, uh, abbreviates to WARF, and that's where the WARF and warfarin comes from. And so um, this team of, of researchers synthesized warfarin as a potent uh, dicumerol compound. And it was basically used um, commercially um, to kill uh, rats and other pests. Um, and it was actually not until um, someone um, overdosed on warfarin intentionally as a suicide attempt and was treated with vitamin K to reverse its um, blood thinning properties that it was considered this may have actually. Um, a clinical application as a blood thinner. And um, in the uh, mid 1950s, it was approved. And actually, President Eisenhower was one of the first um, patients to use warfarin after uh, he suffered his heart attack. Just an interesting historical aside. <clears throat> so, so how does warfarin work? Um, so um, coagulation factors uh, like thrombin um, and a few others require this carbon dioxide residue to be added 
to the enzyme in order to function properly. And this carbon dioxide residue um, is, is placed there by an enzyme, carboxylase, that uses uh, vitamin K in its reduced form. Um, the, uh, the biochemists in the audience will, will like this slide. Um, so um, in order to kind of produce more uh, reduced vitamin K to allow this enzyme um, to work, uh, this enzyme vitamin K oxide reductase uh, is required. And this is what warfarin inhibits. So warfarin basically prevents um, the, the synthesis of functional um, factors that, that require vitamin K. So this will be thrombin, um, factor seven, factor nine, and factor 10. So warfarin um, works great because it inhibits um, four different uh, coagulation factors. So it, there's a lot of functional redundancy. And so the use of uh, warfarin as an anticoagulant, um, it's tried and true. It's been, been used for decades. It uh, is really approved for um, a diverse set of applications for anticoagulation, uh, things like mechanical heart valves um, and other conditions. It can be used if there's kidney dysfunction. Um, you can monitor the levels of drug in the body, basically how anticoagulated you are. Um, that's with a test called the INR um, that I'm sure some of you are very familiar with. And there's established protocols for reversing the effects of warfarin um, if there's urgent surgery or bleeding um, or overdose. The drawbacks to warfarin are that it requires monitoring. So you need to monitor the INR periodically to determine um, how much, how anticoagulated you are and adjust the dose. Um, this uh, comes along with a lot of dietary restrictions, uh, green leafy vegetables, things that are rich in vitamin K. Um, you need to eat them at a very consistent amount. Otherwise, your um, <clears throat> INR levels, your warfarin levels will, will vary quite a bit. Um, warfarin requires a bridge. What I mean by that is when you take warfarin, you're not anticoagulated immediately. Um, it takes a few days for the drug to build up to therapeutic levels in the body. So you need to be on some form of anticoagulation while those drug levels build up. And that's typically done with a heparin molecule. And compared to some of the newer drugs that we'll talk about in a second, um, there's, there's more bleeding associated with warfarin. Uh, so that's, that's a big drawback. And, and so all of these issues <clears throat> led to the development of a bunch of uh, new oral anticoagulants, um, some of which have been on the market for over a decade now. Um, in general, the class term for these is direct oral anticoagulants or DOACs. Um, <clears throat> so the good thing about them is that they require absolutely no monitoring. You don't have to check INRs um, or anything else. Um, they have an improved safety profile uh, with regards to bleeding compared to warfarin. They have a rapid onset. So as soon as you take the drug, you're anticoagulated. That's great. There's no bridging required. They have a fixed dose. You don't need to constantly adjust the dose based on the INR. <clears throat> they have a shorter half-life. So um, when you given a, a day or, or two days, the drug is out of your system. Uh, it's great if there is um, you're planning a surgery or um, if there's trauma, other issues. The drawbacks are that compared to warfarin, um, our protocols for reversing the effect of these drugs uh, is not as well established. There are some antidotes um, and, and some more in clinical development, but uh, doctors aren't quite as comfortable using these yet. Um, the shorter half-life is also a drawback because uh, it, it means that, that patient compliance is very important. If you miss a dose, you're really not gonna be anticoagulated at all for, for that time period. Uh, compared to warfarin. And the fact that you don't need to monitor it is great, but if you want to measure drug levels for some reason, let's say if you have an urgent surgery or um, there's bleeding issues, um, it can be very difficult to, to measure the level of drug in the system. Um, and it, because these drugs haven't been tested in, in all of the same clinical scenarios that warfarin has, um, they have a little bit more limit in terms of indications for anticoagulation. So how did these drugs work? Um, <clears throat> the, the first uh, DOAC on the market, uh, Dibigatran, brand name Pradaxa, inhibits um, thrombin. And the other drugs, Rivaroxaban, brand name Xarelto, Apixaban, which is Eliquis, and the newest one, Adoxaban, uh, 
um, which is uh, Savesa, um, inhibits uh, factor 10. So these are all small molecules that bind one enzyme and inhibit its active site. Um, and these drugs have a bunch of different characteristics. Um, these are spelled out in, in your handout, which, I, which is uh, just perfect for this talk. Um, so um, the way that Pradaxa and Cevesa were tested in studies, they required that patients were on a blood thinner for five, uh, like a heparin uh, blood thinner um, that they received IV or sub-Q for five days before the drug was started. Whereas for Xarelto and Eliquis, um, in theory, you could be started on the drug uh, as the first type of anticoagulation that you received. Um, so this is actually a great bonus. Um, let's say you, you, prevent, you present to the hospital with, with a DVT or a PE, but you're clinically well enough to, to not be admitted to the hospital. You could go home on an oral drug and avoid the needle altogether. Um, uh, Adoxaban can be dose reduced for low body weight or uh, kidney dysfunction, which is unique. Um, some of these drugs have a once daily versus some have a twice daily dosing. Uh, they all have varying degrees of um, uh, dependency on, on the kidneys to uh, eliminate the drug for the body. And um, uh, Pradaxa and Xarelto can be associated with some, some GI bleeding, um, maybe more frequently than the others. Um, so, how do these drugs compare to warfarin for clinical use? Um, this is a this is a forest plot where um, these columns on the left side are basically each of the clinical studies, thousands of patients in each that tested um, the DOAC versus warfarin, and <clears throat> basically where the square lands compared to this line suggests um, that the study favored the DOAC or favored warfarin. So, with regards to recurrent um, VTE or uh, VTE related death, um, basically the, the sum kind of falls a little bit uh, favoring DOACs. So it, it's not statistically significant, um, but these studies clearly show that DOACs are non-inferior, meaning they perform equally well as warfarin in terms of treating blood clots. But where the DOACs really shine is regard to safety, bleeding. So you can see here when we talk about major bleeding events compared to warfarin, um, the DOACs clearly all come down on this side um, of favoring um, uh, DOACs as having less bleeding compared to warfarin. And um, this isn't just all, all bleeding. The, the bleeding we really care about, which is bleeding in the head or bleeding that results in death, are, are both significantly reduced with the DOACs compared to warfarin. Um, so this, this safety profile has really uh, revolutionized our um, uh, ability to, to treat uh, blood clots and is the main reason why these drugs, um, in addition to the lack of need to be monitored, the main reason why these drugs have um, actually supplanted warfarin as our go-to anticoagulant these days. I wanna make a, a quick aside about cancer and venous thromboembolism. Um, this, this may affect uh, many of you in the audience. Um, but uh, basically, cancer is a unique condition um, that increases the risk of blood clots uh, for many different factors um, illustrated here. And um, so, so many times cancer is complicated by, by a blood clot. Um, and there was a lot of concern that warfarin uh, wouldn't be as effective for treating these blood clots, difficulties with um, uh, taking oral medications, with maintaining a steady diet, um, and, and so a key study that was done uh, 15 years ago now looked at um, low molecular weight heparin compared to warfarin um, in patients with blood clots in the setting of cancer. And there was a dramatic reduction in recurrent um, blood clots in those treated with, warfarin, uh, with heparin compared to warfarin. Um, and these patients were studied for, um, for almost a year. Um, and then two other studies uh, also reproduced um, similar results um, and showing less recurrent blood clots with low molecular weight heparins compared to warfarin, and there is no increased bleeding observed. So for patients who have uh, cancer-associated DVT or PE, we prefer low molecular weight heparin. Um, this is Lovenox or um, enoxaparin, 
um, as the treatment of choice uh, for um, the short-term um, anticoagulation. And so lastly, I'm just going to move into uh, the long-term or uh, extended anticoagulation. Um, so this is staying on a blood thinner kind of beyond the three to six month point where you need to um, treat the blood clot itself. Um, and so I'll show this study, which um, took patients who were um, treated for a blood clot for six months with warfarin. All these people had an unprovoked blood clot, meaning we don't know what risk factor caused the blood clot to happen. So they were treated for six months, and then half the patients were taken off anticoagulation. The other half were kept on warfarin for another 18 months. And you see that on the, on the y-axis, this is recurrent um, venous thromboembolism. And the patients who were taken off anticoagulation, they, they started to have um, recurrent blood clots. Uh, and you know, by, by uh, six months to a year, 10% had had a recurrent event. There were no recurrent events in the, in the patients who stayed on warfarin. When the patients after 18 months stopped warfarin, they started to have recurrent events and the lines almost intersected um, after, uh, after four, four years, basically. So th this suggests that um, extended anticoagulation can be very important for preventing recurrence of DVT. And this has been studied using the DOAX as well um, in a similar population of unprovoked DVT um, using a Pixaban or Eliquis, uh, even at a lower dose, um, significantly reduced recurrent um, uh, venous thromboembolism compared to placebo. Um, and this did not come at the expense of more bleeding, um, especially with the, with the lower dose of a Pixaban. Um, and then what about aspirin? Aspirin thins the blood to some degree. So this, um, figure here came from two studies that, that showed that, that actually low-dose aspirin um, can significantly reduce um, the recurrence of venous thromboembolism by about 30%. And, and so most recently, a trial looked at Xarelto compared to aspirin for extended anticoagulation after six months of treatment. And even a low dose of rivaroxaban significantly reduced recurrent events um, compared to aspirin. And you see that in the aspirin group, the recurrence rate was 5%. Um, in the in the apixaban trial, where there was no aspirin, the recurrence rate was 10%. So there, there is a reduction with aspirin alone, but it's it's much better with uh, with, with Xarelto. And um, there was some more bleeding in the Xarelto group, but, but not significant. Um, so um, before I get to that, so this just suggests that for, for patients who have an unprovoked venous thromboembolism, um, meaning we, we don't know exactly what caused it, so we don't know what will cause it to come back again, the ability to use some of these lower dose, long-term anticoagulants, uh, Sorelto or um, uh, Eliquis, have, have kind of revolutionized um, our approach um, as it's more safe to and, and tolerable to stand anticoagulation long-term. Um, with with proven efficacy of reducing recurrent blood clots. So this is my last slide, just kind of, uh, and this kind of information um, is in your handout. Um, so what drug is right for you? Uh, we have a lot more choices than just warfarin and Lovenox now. And so we can tailor the therapy that we use based on the, um, the patient, um, you know, characteristics. So we don't need to go through each one of these, but, but basically, in patients who have kidney dysfunction, which is pretty common, um, warfarin is still our go-to option. Uh, we can use Eliquis in certain cases because that's least cleared by the kidneys, but we need to avoid um, Pradaxa, Xarelto, and, and low molecular weight heparins. Um, if you need a once daily option, <clears throat> we, we, there's, there's options for you. Um, if, if you wanna be treated only with an oral drug, never see an IV. Um, we can accomplish that. Um, for patients who are highest bleeding risk, we tend to think that Eliquis may be uh, the most safe. Um, in terms of uh, extended treatment, like I talked about, the, that's where the, the DOAX, namely Eliquis and Xarelto, um, really shine. In, in, in certain conditions, cancer, 
um, pregnancy, which I didn't talk about, but low molecular weight heparins um, are, are safe in pregnancy. We use these drugs. Um, liver failure, it's very difficult to monitor the INR. Um, and the, the DOAX really are not proven safe. Um, and then some conditions that are very high risk, like mechanical heart valves, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, and heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, uh, we still favor warfarin in these settings. So um, this is a real lot of information, and I'm sure there's many questions, and hopefully not too much confusion. I really want to thank uh, NATF for uh, having me speak. Um, and all of the, the crew for helping me organize uh, the talk, and Dr. Goldhaber for giving me the opportunity. And at this point, I uh, would definitely like to open the floor to comments and questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Schmeier. That was excellent. Um, that was a really thorough overview of the many choices that patients and physicians have these days, so we really appreciate it. Um, we did get several questions, so I think we will go ahead and dive right into those, if that works for you. Certainly. Okay. Um, so let's start here. All right, a basic question. Do you have to monitor your vitamin K intake on the DOAX like you do on Warfarin? So uh, I'm assuming no. they're responding to spinach and all that good stuff. <laughs> Right, so so no, you absolutely do not. Um, the DOAX work entirely differently. They have no relation to vitamin K at all. So um, you can eat whatever you want in terms of vitamin K um, on the DOAX. Uh, Zorelto is best absorbed with a meal. It helps the drug get into the system. So it, it is recommended that you take that drug with a meal but that meal could be anything. Excellent, so people can eat all the healthy spinach and, and good vegetables that they want to on those drugs, which is great. Absolutely. Okay, do we have any insight or, or idea of what um, possible long-term effects of the DOAX might be for patients who are, you know, on extended duration anticoagulation? <clears throat> Has there been any research into that? That's a great question. Um, so the, the quick answer is no. Um, you know, these drugs have been on the market now, uh, Pradaxa being the longest, but it's probably used the least frequently. Um, Zarelto has been on the market for several years now, not exactly sure, um, not quite 10 years, I believe. but. Um, so we certainly have experience with patients um, being on them for several years, um, but we have only limited information about the presence of any potential long-term side effects. Um, there is no signal of um, any problems uh, from any of the studies, so there's, there's no suggestion. Um, but, but right, until, until we have patients who are on them for uh, you know, several years, decades, we won't know. But at this point, there's no um, indication there are any problems. It is important to mention that although warfarin has been around for a very long time, warfarin um, does have some long-term um, side effects. It can accelerate uh, calcium deposition um, in, uh, in the blood vessels, and it can promote kidney dysfunction. Um, there is some suggestion that that DOAX, um, you know, may also affect kidney function. Um, that's not as much of a long-term side effect. That can also be seen in the short term, but we we don't know too much about that, and it's not doesn't seem to be a very severe effect on the kidneys. Okay, excellent. All right, so here is um, a patient that had a DVT due to knee surgery, and he was put on a DOAC for six months and taken off. Um, shortly after, he was diagnosed with multiple bilateral PEs that were unprovoked. Um, in both cases, he's just been seen by his GP. He's now on Xarelto, um for life, and he's wondering if you think that he should see a specialist um, to get more information or 
Um, any other tests that you would suggest for him? Yeah, so that, that's a that's a great question. Um, it's a it's a challenging clinical scenario. Um, I'll try to unpack that question piece by piece. So, <clears throat> so first of all, you know, should you see a specialist? Um, you know, I think that uh, that's totally appropriate. I, I don't. I'm I'm not going to say that's absolutely necessary, but I think that if your um, peace of mind will be uh, and questions will be, um, you'll have more peace of mind and have have questions that you want answered. Um, totally appropriate to speak to an anticoagulation specialist. Um, in this scenario, to be on lifelong anticoagulation, that makes the most sense um, because you've you've kind of had you know a, a, a provoked blood clot is um, we kind of give you a pass on that. Having another blood clot after that <clears throat> is um, <clears throat> it really suggests that um, unless there's a high risk of bleeding. Um, it's appropriate to be on a blood thinner indefinitely. In terms of further testing, um, so probably uh, no testing will affect how we manage you um, because we know that your risk of having a recurrent blood clot is high if you come off anticoagulation. Um, there are some blood tests that look for inherited factors in the blood that can predispose to blood clots. Um, this may be more relevant if there's a family history of, of blood clots. Um, and that could be important for uh, your children, especially um, if you have daughters who are of childbearing age um, or granddaughters for that matter of childbearing age. Um, it could affect how um, they would be managed during, um, during pregnancy. So it's worth uh, talking about all those issues and it's totally reasonable that uh, a specialist would be more comfortable discussing and answering all of these uh, questions. Um, so I, I encourage that. Um, and then, you know, I will say that <clears throat> you had a, a you know a, a DVT after after surgery, um, and then an unprovoked DVT after that. You know, the distinction between provoked and unprovoked um, is not black and white. Obviously, many people undergo knee surgery. Many people take oral contraceptives. Many people um, fly a, a long haul air, airplane trip and don't develop blood clots. So we think that there probably are some factors that predispose certain people to have them uh, under these stressful conditions. And then once you've had a blood clot, um, blood clots beget more blood clots. Um, even though the, the clot goes away, the vein may not be totally normal after that, and it may predispose to further blood clots down the line. So <clears throat> I, I think it's very challenging. Um, and I think just knowing that there's more options um, that are well tolerated um, has helped us um, uh, treat patients and, and give them more options and share decision making. Good answer. Thanks. Um, another patient wants to know if the RELSO would be a safe choice for him. Um, he, and this is kind of specific, so maybe it's best answered in terms of, you know, just general. Um, mm -hmm. But they have a GFR of 56 and a creatinine of 1.46. And they're wondering if the RELSO is a bad choice for their kidneys. Yeah, there there weren't, um, you know, fifty six is um, <clears throat> is not is not very low. Um, there's for atrial fibrillation, there is a dose reduction uh, for Xarelto to fifteen milligrams a day, um, but we there's not a dose reduction for Xarelto in that case. Um, and so, I I think that. If you can handle a, a twice a day medication, um, Eliquis would probably be safer just because it's uh, not metabolized by the kidneys as much um, when there's some degree of, of renal dysfunction. Um, but I think that you know that degree of renal dysfunction isn't that severe, so it's certainly um, you know it's not like it's a non-starter. It's not like it's completely unsafe, but uh, there may be better options. Okay, great. Um, to get on to aspirin for a little bit, in the study you showed with aspirin, they um, were wondering why the researchers chose 100 milligrams when that's not a standard dose. 
Yeah, so that's a good question. Very uh, perceptive. So um, in Europe, I think 100 milligrams is uh, the standard dose. It's really just how it's packaged. Um, and so most of those patients were in Europe. And so that was the dose of drug that was given out. It is, um, that's a very good question. And it is considered to be completely equivalent, um, a dose of aspirin between 75 milligrams and 100 milligrams. So um, you could, uh, the 81 milligrams dose of aspirin would be totally effective um, for that indication. Okay, terrific. So. Um, one more question about aspirin. Uh, what are the indications to begin taking 81 milligrams of aspirin in a 50-year-old woman with a strong family of heart disease? Um, she's otherwise health, healthy, good cholesterol level, levels, her weight is normal, no com comorbid conditions. Um, would you still think that's a good idea for her? And this is someone who hasn't had a blood clot, I imagine. Is that correct? I, you know, they do not say, but I would imagine they have not. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a great question. That's, that's actually, yeah, I could do a whole, uh, another hour long talk on that topic. Um, but, but basically, um, so you're talking about aspirin for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Um, by primary prevention, we mean you have not had um, a heart attack or a stroke or have any um, symptomatic signs of um, coronary artery disease, no angina, no peripheral arterial disease, um, but, but you may be concerned about risk factors, and so um, aspirin can reduce that risk. Um, it's a very, uh, for pr so for primary prevention, aspirin um, doesn't have a definitive role like it does for someone with established heart disease. Um, so we look at risk factors, which include cholesterol, blood pressure, um, age, older age being higher risk, gender, male being higher, um, and smoking status, diabetes, to kind of calculate someone's risk. Um, and there's actually online calculators um, that can be found on the American College of Cardiology website uh, to do this. Um, and actually, what's interesting, though, family history isn't part of that calculation. So there are limits to this. And we think that if, if someone's risk, and this is the 10-year risk that's put in by the calculator, if your risk is greater than 20%, um, uh, it, it's, it, the, the risk benefit um, favors starting an aspirin. If your risk is between 10 and 20%, um, that this is a 10-year risk, um, then that's kind of a, a, a shared decision-making process. You'll discuss with your doctor about you know, how aggressive you want to be, um, you know, we think about what your risk of bleeding. Do you have any problems with with, with uh, bleeding, like um, GI distress, uh, anemia, low platelet counts, alcohol use? Um, and on the flip side of that, if your risk is low, less than 10%, then the chances are you're probably more likely to have a bleed on aspirin than prevent a heart attack or a stroke. Um, but really, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but it's a very important question um, that I think is worth discussing with a doctor. Um, and if a, if a GP, um, you know, can answer it uh, to your liking, then seeing a cardiovascular specialist is, is certainly appropriate. Great. Okay, we got a couple questions about Factor V Leiden. Mm -hmm. um, so, in particular, one individual who had a DVT in 2008, they were on warfarin for a year, then they came off, then they had a PE in 2014. Um, now they're back on warfarin for life. Um, they just found out they have factor V Leiden. Mm. And do you think that a DOAC might be more effective for them than warfarin, um, given you know that they have factor V? Um, no, there's no evidence that a DOAC would be more effective than warfarin. Uh, they they should both be equally effective for that condition. Okay. And then um, they want to know what is the long-term mortality um, for a patient with this history? Well, Each today is 50 at they had their first DVT at 41. Yeah, so, so having factor V Leiden um, doesn't uh, affect long-term uh, mortality at all. Um, 
it, it does increase your risk of having um, blood clots, as I'm sure you know. Um, but uh, actually, when it comes to recurrent blood clots, um, usually patients who are treated with anticoagulation, there's actually no increased risk of recurrent blood clots despite having factor V Leiden. So, um, you know, the fact that you've had two uh, recurrent blood clots, um, you know, is certainly concerning, but, but being on long-term anticoagulation um, really should mitigate all of the risk of having a recurrent blood clot. Um, and, and probably um, going forward, um, mor morbidity and mortality are going to be dictated by, you know, is, are there um, presence of any residual DVT or PE symptoms? Um, is there a lot of leg swelling, immobility, um, or residual PE symptoms like shortness of breath or heart failure? Um, and, and probably, uh, you know, other um, risk factors that, that may be present. So just the fact that um, someone has had DVT in the past, um, we don't think has um, a significant effect on long-term um, morbidity or mortality. But I think that data that definitively answers that question um, has been very hard to come by. Um, so a patient is commenting that um, on some of the studies that they have read, if a person's INR is well managed, there is no more risk of bleeding than um, on warfarin than there is on the DOAX. Um, do you know anything um, about that? Yeah, I would say that that's um, almost certainly correct. Um, and, um, you know, ironically, where the, the I don't know if it's ironic, but where where warfarin is probably most effective is actually in a young, healthy patient who has normal kidneys. You know, someone who's um, uh, really has very um, healthy metabolism. Otherwise, it's usually easier to maintain their INR. And when the INR is therapeutic, um, uh, there, there is it's definitely extremely effective, and um, there's not a lot of bleeding. I think the problems with warfarin run in, uh, are, you know, happen because the INR can be difficult to manage in a lot of patients. And so, you know, in patients who I see who have been on warfarin for years and have had no problems with it, I let them know that there's other drugs available if they're frustrated with warfarin. But I firmly believe in, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And if warfarin's been working for you for a long time, then by all means, it's appropriate to stay on it. Okay. Great. Okay, this is um, an interesting question. A patient wants to know if cutting a Xarelto tablet in half, a 20 milligram Xarelto tablet in half, would compromise the integrity and efficacy of the drug. Um, they're asking because the 10 milligram tab is nearly as much as the 20 milligram. Yeah, no, it, that should be just fine. That's a good strategy to. Um... Uh, increase the mileage of your uh, prescription do drug dollars. Um, so the only drug, uh, the anticoagulant that cannot be cut up um, or crushed is Pradaxa um, because it affects how the drug is absorbed. But um, as far as I know, cutting a Xarelto in half, a 20 to make two 10 milligram tablets, um, that's just fine. Just be sure to cut it evenly, <laughs> carefully. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so a patient has been in, on warfarin for over a year, and since they've been on it, they've had a bad cough that won't go away. Even though the cough isn't listed as a possible side effect, do you think it could be? Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, you know, my short answer is yes, um, it, it certainly could be. Um, it's it's certainly not typical. It's not something that 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 we see frequently. I, I can say that I don't know of it to be associated with warfarin. Um, you know, I think that if there's other options for anticoagulation for you, it um, would be reasonable to try switching to another one. Um, it, it's also very likely that there's other causes of cough that it could be related to uh, having had a PE. Um, or there are very common things, you know, it, you may have, there may be more issues with um, gastrointestinal reflux when being on anticoagulation and that can cause cough. Um, so I think it's worth investigating other causes of cough, um, but it's totally reasonable to try switching drugs 
um, if uh, you know nothing else uh, uh, turns up a, a cause of the cough. Okay, excellent. All right. Um, so a patient, another one was factor five who had a blood clot in their leg, which was provoked by foot surgery, and that was 17 years ago. Um, they just had another blood clot in the same leg, which is provoked by wearing a boot for foot pain for three days. Uh, Do you think they should consider switching from warfarin to a DOAC? And sorry, they they weren't on anticoagulation with warfarin for that whole time. Just, just. Uh, no, they were on warfarin for seventeen years. Oh, okay. And they had another blood clot after another DVT after wearing the boot for three days. Oh. I'm sorry. That's yeah. That's that's challenging. And and so the issue of warfarin failure or any anticoagulant failure, um, you know, is is a challenging one. And I think that it's it's worth looking at every detail before you know we say that that you know being on warfarin was the culprit because um, you know so it's very important. Was the INR completely therapeutic during that time that the uh, the um, foot was immobilized? Um, you know if 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 it was, it looks like there was no problems with the warfarin. Um, you know, it it may be reasonable to switch, um, though there, there's no guarantee that um, that that another drug would be more effective. Um, you know, it's also, I mean, the 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 immobilizer looks like a, a perfectly reasonable cause for having a blood clot, um, but I would make sure that things like age appropriate cancer screening are are up to date because. Um, we wouldn't want to miss other causes for a recurrent blood clot, and that would certainly change uh, the type of therapy that we use. Um, so that's a tough one. It's probably better handled, you know, kind of like delving into the details. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure why you might want to do this, I guess. Um, but can you switch back and forth between Warfarin and Doax? Um, well, right. So I, I guess you can, um, you know, I will say that when, when you switch between anticoagulants, um, it's never a perfect switch. And so you always run up against the risk of being too anticoagulated or under anticoagulated anytime you switch between drugs. So that means more risk of bleeding and more risk of recurrent clots. So I wouldn't recommend a switch um, unless you know, there's a really good reason to do it, and I would try to minimize the number of switches you do. Okay, great. Um, do uh, Lovenox shots, can they cause you to be very tired? Is that a side effect? I have not heard about uh, that being reported at all. Um, it's, uh, you know, Lovenox is really, the molecule is, is kind of just, a, it's a natural product. I mean, it's it's processed, but it's it's basically um, these starch-like compounds that are found in our bodies. Um, so um, usually, the, the reaction with with Lovenox is that um, you know you get bruising, um, and and I think that some of the longer heparin molecules uh, we don't see this anymore because no one is on unfractionated heparin for a long time uh, can cause osteoporosis. Um, but with low molecular weight heparin, that shouldn't be an issue. Okay. Uh, and switching gears completely, um, can you say a few brief words about IVC filters and Whoa. maybe their indications? Yeah, th that's kind of a um, yeah a, a soapbox of mine. So so IVC filters. Um, so what are they? They're um, basically a, a little steel, um, kind of like a birdcage-like structure that goes in the large vein um, called the uh, inferior vena cava, which is the big vein that, that um, collects blood from both of the legs. Um, and, and what that filter can do is, um, is potentially catch a blood clot that's embolizing up and prevent it from going to the lungs. So um, the indications, the reasons why an IVC filter should be placed are, are twofold. Um, one, if you have a, a DVT or um, a PE and you cannot be anticoagulated. Um, 
In this case, we, you know, the risk of having a recurrent DVT uh, that extends up or embolizes off is very higher if you can't be treated with a blood thinner. So that's appropriate to place an IVC filter. Uh, the other indication um, would be a scenario like um, if you have a, um, a very severe PE, you're very sick, um, and you or you you have maybe other underlying lung disease, um, and you still have more blood clot in your legs. And even though you're on anticoagulation, there's a concern that if you had another PE, it could be fatal. Um, in those scenarios, uh, we place an IVC filter, um, you know, oftentimes. So, but um, I think there's a lot of, um, uh, so an IVC filter is not a free lunch. Uh, so it, it is associated with um, some protection from pulmonary embolus. And in, in large trials, we see fewer PEs in people who have IVC filters, which makes sense. But we also see more DVTs because the IVC filter restricts blood flow from the lower extremities. Um, it's a foreign body. So the reduction in PE comes at the expense of more DVTs. So we, we have to ask ourselves, uh, are the PE we're trying to prevent, does it um, outweigh the risk of a, of a further blood clot in the legs? And so, you know, I, I've certainly seen patients that get an IVC filter when they have a small blood clot in the legs and a few days later have massive clot extending up in both legs. Um, and uh, the, most of the filters nowadays are, are designed to be removed, placed uh, temporarily. So they're placed when there's a, a reason why you can't anticoagulate and then taken out once um, you can be safely anticoagulated. But sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, patients switch providers, they are far away, and the filter stays in for a long time and complications from that can happen. The filter can, can migrate uh, up, it can break into pieces, it can erode through the, um, through the IVC, through the vein. Um, so I, I think if we're placing a filter, we should be very uh, conscious of the, um, the, the, the pros and the cons and why we're doing it and, and remove the filter as soon as it's not necessary. It's, it requires a lot of vigilance. Okay, great. And last kind of question, and it's along the, um, the, the lines of the IVC filters we were just talking about, is how long typically do you have to worry about a clot breaking off um, and creating a PE? And is there anything that you, if you have a DVT, is there anything you should avoid doing um, to stop that clot from breaking off? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, uh, you know, we we think that that the risk of um, of a clot breaking off, uh, first of all, once you are um, on a therapeutic blood thinner, um, the risk uh, decreases dramatically because um, the clot will stop extending in size, and it's the edges of the clot start to get kind of remodeled by our natural fibrinolytic system. And so the clot stabilizes. It may still be there, but it's not um, growing and it's not um, shedding off pieces anymore. So um, do I have an exact uh, number of days or hours? No, I, I don't. And it probably depends on the type of clot and, and some other patient scenarios. But usually, um, you know, I say kind of once you're feeling better in terms of leg pain and swelling, um, that usually means that that the clot has has stabilized uh, to a point where um, you know you can safely get out of bed and move around. Um, so I would say that in the initial phase, when um, when you have a DVT and um, uh, basically the anticoagulation is maybe not therapeutic yet, um, it's uh, you're still having a lot of pain. That may be the time to keep your leg um, relatively still. Um, and we use compression stockings in those cases. Um, but basically, as, as soon as you're feeling better, we actually encourage you to get up and move around quickly because that helps um, your body naturally break down the blood clot. Excellent. So last question, and it's a question I always like to ask. Do you have any advice for patients diagnosed with a DVT or PE? Well, that's... Um, it's a very challenging question. Um, I will. I have lots of advice. Um, uh, 
in terms of the blood thinner, since this was a talk about a blood thinner, one thing, um, you know, I, I do like to advocate that patients um, kind of make um, their other providers aware of the fact that they are on a blood thinner. Um, so I encourage patients to get a medical alert bracelet um, that says they're on an anticoagulant and potentially which one. Uh, you can buy these uh, online. Uh, there may be links on the uh, NATF website, I imagine. Um, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, if there's an issue where you can't speak for yourself or you're in the emergency room um, or, on, uh, you know, having first responders um, find you uh, in the field, be very helpful um, for them to know that you're on a blood thinner. Um, you know, I, I think that there is so much anxiety and uncertainty when someone is found to have a blood clot, um, especially when it comes unprovoked. Um, you're not alone. It's a very um, common thing, and we uh, have really good treatments for it. Um, unfortunately, still there's there can be a lot of long-term complications despite um, adequate treatment, and I, and I think that we're starting to see a lot of patients um, who have um, what we call post-PE syndrome. Um, it's and in even post-DVT syndrome, there's a lot of anxiety and depression. Um, and I think that I really try to encourage patients to stay active. Um, and that can, there's mechanical reasons why that can improve uh, the clot and, and help break down the clot. But I think, um, you know, this is a big uh, speed bump, but it really doesn't have to be a roadblock. And that I, I really encourage patients to, to get back and live their lives um, and live a healthy lifestyle. Uh, and that helps with both the physical and the mental recovery. Uh, from a blood clot. All right, excellent. Well, I think that's a great place to end. Uh, we went a little over tonight, so I'd like to thank everyone for sticking with us, and especially thank you, Dr. Schreier. This was awesome. Um, it was really informative and, and answering the questions. We appreciate you take, taking the time to do that, so thank you. Catherine, thank um, you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you so much. I really, I really appreciate the opportunity. I hope this was helpful. Oh, it was very helpful. Um, so to let everyone know, I, I received a few notes that people were having trouble accessing the handout, the anticoagulant comparison chart. So we'll go ahead. We'll email it out to the group. So you guys will have a copy on that. You can also find it on the NATF website under patient um, and physician resources. It's on both those pages. Um, next month, we are having online support group on May 9th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, Dr. Marie Gerhard Herman, who's a vascular medicine specialist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, will be presenting. Uh, as you all know, having a blood clot or any medical problem can be very stressful. Um, and she is going to be talking about simple steps to develop a beneficial response to stress which I think will be applicable to many aspects of our lives. Um, so I hope that you guys will all join us for that. And thank you again for your time. And I look forward to speaking with you next month. Bye-bye. Don't miss Marie's talk. She is fantastic. You will love it. I guarantee it. Yes. Thank you for that <laughs> plug. She is. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, guys.